Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager of Dataversity. We'd like to thank you for joining the Dataversity webinar, Focus on Your Analysis, Not Your SQL Code, sponsored today by Altrix. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. And if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag Dataversity. If you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. Just click the chat icon in the upper right upper right hand corner for that feature and as always we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides the recording of this session and additional information requested throughout the webinar now let me introduce to you our speakers for today beth narish and dan hilton beth is a senior product man marketing manager for altrix she has over 10 years experience in finance market research and analytics software with roles in product marketing channel marketing and solutions marketing a strong communicator with excellent interpersonal skills, Beth exhibits a high-energy, can-do attitude with a unique ability to manage cross-functional teams, drive collaboration, and deliver on a unified vision. Dan provides solutions and service focus on analytics, big data processing, predictive modeling, and server integrations. He has delivered analytic projects across many industries, including real estate, healthcare, retail, marketing, and financial services. His continued role as a solutions architect focuses on server implementation application architecture and data governance and with that let me turn it over to Dan and Beth to get us started hello and welcome thanks so much everybody for joining us today I'm Beth and I'm going to go ahead and kick us off and we'll start first with the agenda today we're going to talk through the historical approach that exists within organizations to analytics and how SQL fits in with that as well as some challenges that we may face we'll talk about who Alteryx is as well as what our platform is delivering and then walk through some benefits of a workflow and then I'll pass it over to Dan who will actually show you the product in action and do a demo for you so you can see Alteryx in action next slide please so the traditional approach to analytics that exists within organizations is often frustrating for many parties involved at all touch points of the process that you can see on the screen. For DBAs and IT, for statisticians and data scientists, and also for analysts who sit in various lines of business. This process often starts when an analyst is looking to create a report to help solve a business problem. They need a specific data set, so they'll submit a request or, request or a ticket um, for these data pools or these data sets, and these data pools often are turned around by a very busy IT team and oftentimes an overworked database analyst. But what often happens right when that data set is about to be delivered to the analyst is something needs to change. That analyst wants to look at something different, the client requests that a report looks a a little bit different than it did last month and this kicks off the whole process to start all over again at the very beginning so it's frustrating for everyone involved there's too many people that need to touch the data using too many different tools with too many steps in the process and from the analyst perspective it's not only affecting their performance but also their job satisfaction Next slide, please. So what tools are being used for analysis within organizations? Well, as you may imagine, spreadsheets like Excel are still by and far the preferred tool to do this analysis. But in a survey that we're quoting here and was published by the Harvard Business Review, actually 37% of respondents indicated that they're using low-level SQL queries for their data analysis. So what exactly does this mean? It means that if you're not a SQL coder by trade, but you happen to be sitting in an analyst position in an organization, you might be teaching yourself how to write SQL code. So if that's the case, this might not be something that you want to do, it might not be something that you're good at, and writing code may not even be what you're interested in doing in your job. But most of us know analysts, or we are analysts, and we know that they'll do whatever it takes to get the job done. So they're finding ways to make this work for them. They're able to, with writing the SQL code, be more efficient, get the access to the data that they need faster, and to eventually create the insights that they need to help them solve a business problem. So why SQL? Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, SQL is the standard language for relational database management systems. It's been the primary language for actually over 40 years. 
this primary language is for Oracle, for SQL Server, for MySQL, for DB2, and honestly, probably 100 different databases. So these analysts who are resilient are doing what they do best. They're solving problems, and they're going to their IT counterparts or the database analysts who historically have given them these data files or these data sets, and they're asking, if you will, for a lesson in coding 101. So they're requesting the SQL scripts that this DBA has created, and the analyst is taking that SQL script, the existing script, updating the code, and making it work for new data pools that they need to do additional analyses. So many of these analysts are using SQL to query these databases and to export that data to Excel for analysis purposes. Now, you be, may be wondering about NoSQL. It has gained popularity with Hadoop, with Mongo, and with others, but by and far, at the end of the day, SQL is still king. So that said, there are challenges that this SQL coding can bring to the table for analysts who aren't necessarily savvy in writing this code. Can you go to the next slide, please, Dan? Um, as I mentioned earlier, analysts who are teaching themselves SQL or learning it from their IT colleagues aren't necessarily trained in writing this coding language. They often don't have formal education in this space. They might not even be necessarily interested in writing their code. But even if they've been able to do one data pool themselves, SQL is like so many other things. It takes practice in order to get good at it. But even more so, it takes practice to keep up on your skills. So for example, if you look to do a quarterly report in Q4 and you use some SQL code from a DBA and were able to do that export of data yourself, if you have to run the same query again, but with Q1 numbers this time, if you haven't touched that code or touched any type of SQL code for three months, it's really hard for an analyst to keep their skills sharp over this period of time. And stepping a little bit broader outside of the IT, the DBAs, and these analysts, think about the other colleagues that are interested in the data outcomes within your organization. Oftentimes, these colleagues can't pick up SQL code and read it or to understand what this code is meant to do. They don't necessarily understand transformations that were made to the data, and when data changes, which we all know is frequent, managers or business leaders who don't know how to read SQL may not be able to repeat the steps that you did in your process. So if they are by chance able to understand what you did with your analysis if they're trying to replicate that process. If they have to do any sort of troubleshooting at each step of the query, it's something that can be very tedious and often takes a lot of time. So how can Alteryx help? Some of you may be familiar with us, some of you may not, but we are a leading platform for self-service data analytics, and we are giving analysts the ability to prep, blend, and analyze all of their data in a workflow that is repeatable, to go out to the broader organization with the ability to deploy and share analytics and scale, and finally, to circumvent, if you will, that historical approach that does exist within organizations that takes a lot of time, and to give the analyst the ability to deliver those deeper insights in hours, not weeks. So in terms of our overall platform, how are we delivering these capabilities? So I mentioned that we're a repeatable workflow to prep, blend, and analyze data. The very first thing that we want you to be able to do is to input all of the relevant data that you need to solve your business problem, regardless of where that data sits in the format it's in. So whether it's structured, unstructured, or semi-structured, if it's sitting in a SQL server, in Hadoop, in a data warehouse, anywhere in the cloud, or even sitting on your desktop in Excel, the ability to access all of this data, pull it together, and to create your analytic data set, we give you the ability to join all of those different sources together based on common fields. Now, if all of those sources aren't enough and you're looking for some third-party data to supplement the information that you do have access to, we do give you the ability to enrich your data with demographics from either the census or Experian, with business data from Dun & Bradstreet, and also with spatial data that's provided by TomTom. Tom. Now, on the screen, you can see what the actual workflow looks like, and you'll be able to see this more specifically when Dan goes through the demo. But if you're looking to now take the next step in your analytics process, which is actually doing the analysis, it's all done in the same drag and drop workflow with no coding required. So if you're looking to do statistical analysis, predictive analysis, or spatial analysis, all within the same work, one visual workflow. And the last step of the process is that the insights that you're creating as an analyst really need to be shared without your broader organization. 
With this legacy approach to analytics, reports often have been created in a totally separate environment, but with Alteryx, this is really just one more step at the end of the workflow, giving you the ability to create static reports in Alteryx, to export data for visualization to Click or Tableau, and also to create analytic applications that will allow other people within your organization to actually run the analyses themselves. And as I mentioned, Dan will show you this in detail later in the webinar. So now that you understand who we are as an organization, what the Alteryx platform can help deliver, how specifically can Alteryx help people that are writing code in SQL? Well, the first way that we can help is really with transparency. SQL code is not easy for everyone to understand, especially when you step outside of our line of business analysts who are learning it and the ITs and DBAs who are really experts in this area. When we go to other parts of the organization, managers, decision makers, business leaders, it's not easy for them to pick up and understand SQL code. And oftentimes, they do have questions to understand what your analytics process was. Unfortunately, delivering transparency in SQL is very challenging but because it requires that you, the analyst, as well as these decision makers can look at and understand the SQL code. Unfortunately, it is not as easy as just sending someone your code and assuming that they'll know what's happening in your programming. In addition, if there happens to be something within that code that doesn't work, digging through it to understand where the code is broken is very tedious and time-consuming. With Alteryx, in terms of our workflow and just by nature a very visual platform, it's really easy for not only you, but also decision makers and business leaders within your organization, not only to one, translate your process, but two, to replicate your process if necessary. So not only can you see what you've done, others within your organization can see and understand it as well. Next slide. Thank you very much. Um, secondly, we just want to touch on transformations. Generally speaking, Becoming efficient and proficient in SQL is something that overall can take years of training. Uh, the ability to extract, to transform, and to load the right data set in a timely manner to help you understand or impact that business decision means that you not only need to be fast, but you need to be accurate in terms of the delivery of your code. So not only do you need to be able to write your code quickly, you want to write code that also runs very quickly on the back end. And let's be honest, from an analyst perspective sitting in the line of business, not many analysts want to write or sift through hundreds or thousands of lines of code. And even for the ones who have become very savvy at taking the code from DBAs, adapting that code and rewriting it, it might still take hours, if not days, to get the code updated, running, tested, and documented. Contrary to that, with Alteryx, extractions and transformations really have the ability to happen seamlessly without writing any code. And it really is just as easy as dragging, dragging and dropping your tool onto a workflow and adjusting parameters. One of our customers, BAE, um, we have a customer testimonial on our website, was using SQL code to create dashboards for human resources. They ended up using Alteryx, and they explained to us that the change management and the code updating process within Alteryx took them only seven and a half minutes. Um, so the analyst who was specifically responsible first for the SQL code and then for using Alteryx indicated that not only was he very impressed, but his broader team was very impressed in terms of the time that it took them to do this. And he himself was really excited to not only spend less time writing SQL code, but actually to be able to spend more time at home. And in terms of debugging, testing, and prototyping, one of the biggest struggles that analysts face in writing SQL code is just getting that code to work. There's no autocorrect that's in SQL, so if you have a period or a comma that's in the wrong location, it won't be caught automatically and it can end up making your whole script fail. So if you can kind of think of this typical prototyping scenario, you write your SQL statement, you wait for it to run, only to realize that the output isn't giving you the data set that you want. And remember, this process is an iterative one. So you'll write it again, run it again, wait again, rinse and repeat, and it sometimes can take you hours, if not days, to get you the output that you're actually looking for when SQL isn't your coding language of preference or you're sitting in an analyst role. In contrast, a workflow within Alteryx makes debugging, testing, and prototyping so much more efficient, giving you the ability to understand exactly what is happening at each stage of the process transparently. So if you're building out a workflow and you notice an error, it's really easy to go right to that point in the workflow and make the change without starting over. 
Another customer quick example here is AAA, also a video testimonial that's on our website. And what this customer indicated that he loves about Alteryx is he no longer dreams about the lines of code in front of his eyes when he sleeps, looking for that one code that's broken in SQL, because with Alteryx he can find everything, he knows where he is in the process, and no documentation is needed because not only can he look at the process, but everyone else can see it right in front of them as well. And the last two points to make are really about accessibility and flexibility. From the accessibility perspective, if you think about how much data has changed over the past 10, 15, 20 years, a lot of data is now unstructured, social data, machine data, log files. And so a lot of organizations are moving to NoSQL data warehouses to store and analyze this information. But for analysts who are learning SQL, it was really developed in the era of RD, BMSs, so data stored in rows and columns, right? So today's non-relational databases like Mongo, Hadoop, and Hive don't store data in this structured manner. So bottom line is, if you're using SQL to access structured databases, using it to access unstructured data just won't work. And in contrast, this is really the very first step that we talked about with Alteryx earlier. We're not discriminating when it comes to data structure or data location. We want to make it really easy for you to connect to and to access data regardless of its format, regardless of its location, so the accessibility of Alteryx is really vast. And finally, flexibility. If anyone's familiar with writing programming and coding, leniency is probably not a word that you would use to describe the structure. If a code is not written correctly, it's not going to run, a process is not going to complete. So for some of these analysts and lines of business who have learned enough SQL to be dangerous, if you will, flexible probably isn't the word that they'd use to describe this code writing process. So it might be easy for them to request code from their DBA or their IT colleague modifying the code to execute another data pool to access a file with different specs isn't always straightforward or simple. A lot of times it's multiple attempts at trial and error that's taking up time that they just don't have. In a workflow environment like Alteryx, it's flexible enough to not only allow you to develop a new workflow and a new analytics procedure, but we also do give you the ability to leverage existing SQL statements that you may have written, and you can implement those into your analysis as well. And you will see that as part of the demo that Dan is going to now. Um, I keep mentioning the workflow, so I'm going to pass it over to him to actually show you a demo of how easy it is to use and how everything works together. Great. Thanks, Beth. All right. So let's, uh, let's dive right in to some examples and kind of see how, what this development process looks like. Um, so when you open up Alteryx Designer, you'll see an interface that looks like this. Uh, it's a drag and drop interface as Beth described. Uh, there are a variety of tool categories that you'll notice along the top here. So we've got a whole bunch of different tools for uh, data preparation, data blending, um, <laughs> combining, joining, parsing, and then we have some more advanced uh, capabilities as well around predictive um, data investigation and profiling, uh, some spatial analytics and things like that. Uh, so let's start with some kind of simple examples that relate to concepts that you'll be familiar with as a, as a SQL um, user. I'm going to go to my in out category and look for a tool called input data. I drag the tool directly from my toolbar into my workspace area here. Uh, with this tool, I can pull in uh, a huge variety of uh, data file types. So um, all these mm, possible data types from file. I can also connect to uh, databases. So in this case, I'm going to connect to a SQL server. So I'm going to provide a name for my connection. I'll just call it uh, Dan's database. And I'm going to provide a SQL server machine name. And I'll just test that my Windows authentication will get me in. So it looks like it's successful. And I'm going to select my default database. So now uh, I get an interface that will allow me to define some type of a query and to see all, all the tables on that database. 
Uh, so initially, I'm going to look at a, a customer's table that I know I have in here. Uh, so I can browse among my tables and pull in customers. I'll just pull in all the fields. So there's a visual query builder that you're probably familiar with from uh, Microsoft um, SQL Management Studio or some other similar type of tool. So I've defined my connection, and now I can just pull my data into my workflow by pressing this Run button at the top. So I press Press play. Uh, I see in my results pane here at the bottom left that my process worked. So it tells me a few things about what happened, how many records I pulled in, how long it took. I can also visualize my data right off the bat. So we have a tool here in the in out category called browse. I pull that tool into the canvas area and it connects up automatically to my, my input tool. Now when I press run, I get to see the data that I pulled in. So I have a little uh, results pane here on the bottom right that gives me a look at all the data that I'm pulling in. So it looks like this, uh, this customer's database contains some information about our customers, a uh, variety of fields. So we've got 10 fields. Uh, we can do a little bit of um, profiling on the data that's coming in. So as we click on columns here, we can visualize uh, some profiling information. So this is kind of useful for understanding if there's uh, any types of data quality problems, understanding distribution of data, um, understanding data types, and, and things like that, identifying uh, empty, empty fields and things of, of that nature. All right, so we've pulled some data in from our table, and now we're going to do a couple simple operations. I'll go to my preparation category. Uh, we've got a variety of tools in this category for kind of common uh, data preparation activities, things like filtering, uh, generating formulas, sampling, uh, things like that. One of the tools that we use very commonly is called a select tool. It allows us to do things like uh, renaming. So I could call this field customer ID. Uh, so it's basically equivalent to a SQL as. Uh, it allows us to change data types. So this would be kind of analogous to a SQL uh, cast or convert. Uh, allows us to remove columns from our data stream at this point in the process. So for my example here, there's a lot of these columns that I don't really need, so I'm going to turn these off. And now we, when we use our browse tool, we can visualize the data at, at each point. So here I have a browse tool that shows me the tabular data as it comes in and profiling information if I need to see that. But then we've, met, we've done this transformation step where we've, we've modified our data a little bit and removed some columns. So now I can visualize the data at that point in the process. And now we can add another tool uh, to make our data distinct. So uh, what we can do, maybe we want to get a distinct list of countries. We'll use a tool called Unique, and we'll unique on country. Press Run again, and now we see in our results that we've got a column that is unique uh, unique country values in the country column. One of the things to notice is that the unique tool um, outputs the unique data out of one side and the duplicate data out of another side. This uh, gives us a lot of transparency in the process in terms of fallout. Um, and, and we'll see this paradigm uh, in other places as well. Uh, we haven't lost any records. We can treat our fallout records here uh, if we need to, 
to do additional processing on them. We can basically split our data stream into multiple chunks and treat different sets of data differently. And then we'll talk about how we combine those streams in a minute. So just a, a kind of a simple example showing um, a, a, a query that kind of looks in SQL, you would see a query that was something um, like this, a select distinct uh, customers uh, from our customers table. Uh, we would produce a list like this. Um, we're basically accomplish the, accomplishing the same thing using um, some Alteryx tools, including this unique tool. So let's look at another example. In this example, I'm going to pull some data from a table in my database called orders. So I could go through that process of finding the SQL server and finding the table again, but I also I can reuse a connection that I've just made. So I, I set up this Dan's database connection previously. Now I can just reuse it. I don't have to go through that setup process again. So I'm going to look for my orders table. I'm going to pull in all the fields. Again, I'll browse the data right off the bat to make sure I understand what it looks like. So we've got, uh, looks like we've got an order ID, we've got a customer ID, we've got an order amount, and then a few other attributes about the, the, um, the order. And we can do um, some different types of filtering activities that are analogous to different SQL functions as well. So we have a tool called filter that comes from the preparation category. I'll pull that in. You'll notice that the filter tool has two outputs, a true and a false. Uh, so we can define some type of an expression that we want to uh, use to break records into two different streams. So. Maybe what I want to do is I want to um, I want to look at my fields and I want to say my order date should be greater than or equal to some date. Maybe let's say um, 2016 1201, and then we also want it to be. Um, less than a certain date as well. So we want it to fall in, inside of a certain range. So now we'll inject our order date uh, column, and we can say less than or equal to uh, some other value, maybe 2016, 12, 31. To test that, we'll just press play again. We see that 76 records out of the 1,000 that we started with um, basically met that uh, criteria. So this is a this is equivalent to uh, a SQL uh, between. I have the ability to um, to annotate each tool as I go to kind of provide documentation. You'll notice that there's documentation, these little white boxes below each tool. These are automatically supplied, and they give you some idea about what the expression or the input data is. Uh, so here I can annotate this and say this is equivalent to like a SQL between. We've also got a variety of tools in the documentation category that can um, allow us to label different sections of our workflow that we call these tool containers. So this one I could label as um, a select. This one I could label as my between. And you'll notice that we get the, we get the fallout from this filter process as well. So we get 76 records that met the criteria. We get um, a 924 that fall out, and we can review uh, each of those uh, records in, by looking at the results. 
We could do a similar process um, with filtering, uh, maybe equivalent to an in statement. So let me just show real quick. I'm going to connect again to my um, my customers database or table here. I could use filter in the same way that I would use a SQL in. Maybe I just want to grab my customers that are in a certain country, uh, United States or United Kingdom. So here's my uh, in operator. Now when I run this, look at the results. It looks like I've got 800 some odd records that are in the US and the UK. And then my fallout records are everywhere else. So there's like there's a lot of transparency in our process because we understand fallout at every point that we're producing fallout. And if we had to, we could treat that differently and it's very quick to troubleshoot um troubleshoot fallout. So if we're if we weren't expecting some particular type of condition, um you know, we can we can see that very clearly in our uh, browse process. And, the, and using these, uh, this labeling mechanism for the documentation uh, helps us produce a workflow that is reusable. Um, it's clearly understood. We have this visual paradigm where you can see the data flowing through the process, and um, it's organized in a way that a new person could come along and pick it up and uh, kind of have a sense for, for what piece of the process is doing what. So we've done some simple filtering. We've done some kind of uh, simple select um, select as types of operations. So let's talk a little bit about um, blending data. We have a category called join that allows us to do a variety of things, things like um, just simple joins, uh, unioning data, so stacking records on top of one another, appending fields, so that is kind of like a equivalent to a cross join. Uh, we also have some capability to do things like a fuzzy matching or some more advanced types of joining. So I'm going to again pull in my customers. And I'll also pull in orders. And I'm going to join these two data sets on a key. You remember from the previous example, we uh, we identified that there was a um, a uh, ID that was in common between these two sets. So what we could do is a simple join process and equivalent to a SQL inner join, where we can point to the uh, column from each source that is our key. So on the left, we have a here we have one called country. On the right, um, oh, sorry, I'm going to actually use a different database for this. I'm going to use a, a distributions table. Distribution centers. And I'll just browse this real quick to make sure I understand the format of the distributions. Okay, so we've got a distribution center ID, a country, and a name. And I've still got my customers. I can join my customers and my uh, distribution centers on some uh, column in common, some key. So in this case, I'll join by country. And I see records that did join according to an inner join, I see records that fall out on either side. So these records coming out of this input are present in this data source, uh, but they did not join to this data source. These records were present in this data source and did not join, so we don't have any records there. So we had no fallout on the right and some fallout on the left. So I'm just going to label this as inner join. Uh, 
Uh, we could do a similar type of operation to accomplish a SQL cross-join. So for this, I'm going to use a tool that's actually a little different. It's called Append. Append is kind of a um, multiplicative uh, effect uh, cross-join. I kind of think of it as kind of a dumb join. It's just going to put all data from both sides together. And we'll browse the result. So we had 1,000 records coming out of our customers table. We had five records coming out of our distribution centers. And then our resulting data uh, has 5,000 records. So that's just a kind of a quick sample of some of the tools in the join category. Um, so now let's look at a little bit more complex example. Let's, let's think about uh, actually trying to solve a, a, a more um, standard type of use case that you might see in your business. Uh, we have a, maybe we have a real business problem where uh, we'd like to take our customers and take our orders, and we want to determine what uh, non-U.S. countries have the highest average order size. With Alteryx, we can rapidly prototype and test this process in a way that's kind of understandable and accessible to both developers that may be more used to coding and analysts that are familiar with data, but maybe they're not. They're not developers or coders. So we can build a process that answers that question fairly quickly. I'm going to, again, start with my input data tool. First, I'm going to find customers. And then I'm going to find orders. And I'm going to limit um, some of my uh, customers. So I'm going to use a filter tool again. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to say where my um, country does not equal the United States. So we're looking for everything outside of the U.S. And I'll just test that real quick. So we've got 254 records outside of the U.S. And we can QC that real quick here. Looks good. Um, and next step is we want to uh, join together these two data sets. So I'm going to use that join tool again. I'm going to take my non-U.S. records and all of my orders. I'm going to join by customer. I'm going to join by ID on the left side and customer ID on the right side. Test my process. And it looks like we've got some fallout on all sides. So uh, remember before uh, I, I noted that we can deal with the fallout um, of each of the, the, we can deal with the join data or either, either piece of the fallout. And suppose that we want to keep 100% of customers, whether or not they had an order in the orders database. We looked previously at how to create an inner join, uh, but we could just as easily do an, uh, like a left outer join. So we have an additional tool in our union category, or our join category called union. I can drag this in and take my joined results and my left fallout results and send them both into uh, a union tool. So now we've got the equivalent here of a left outer join. I can label my, my process as I go along. Uh, I can also use these tool containers to kind of provide some structure as well. So 
that people coming after me can understand how this process works. All right, so I, I've done my left outer join. Uh, next, I want to do something a little more complicated. I want to do some type of a roll-up. So I have a transform category here, and one of the tools in this category is called summarize. I'm going to use this to do uh, kind of like a group by operation. So I'm going to group by country. Rem remember, our ultimate goal here is to um, determine uh, average order size by country. So I'm going to find my country column, and I'm going to say group by. And then I want to average the total amount for my orders uh, by country. So I'm going to add an aggregation operation here. I want to average um, my total uh, order amount to come up with a, a country level order average. I can test my result here real quick. So it looks like we've got a unique list of countries, and then we've got uh, order averages per country. And we could filter this out a little bit more. Suppose we want to have um, another another type of SQL process similar to like a having clause. Uh, what we could do is supply another filter, and we could say we want our average total amount to be greater than or equal to some threshold. In our case, let's say it's a thousand. And I'll document this just to make sure it's clear. And I'll say that this is our um, basically our group by aggregation function. And then this bit is equivalent to a SQL having. And we're almost done. We've almost answered our question here. Um, we've got we've got our unique countries. We've got our average order amounts. Uh, now let's just clean this up a little bit. Let's sort it by the average amount. So I'm going to use a sort tool from the preparation category. I'm going to sort by average total amount descending so that the highest one is first. And we basically have our answer now. And here's our answer. Um, we've arrived at our answer uh, with a, a documented, repeatable, and accessible workflow uh, that can output to a wide variety of other formats. So from here, now that I've got my answer, I can use an output data tool, which is very similar to my input data tool. I can write to any of these file types. So you'll note, um, all kinds of uh, Microsoft Access, Excel, uh, SQLite, Tableau. Let's write a Tableau data extract here. So um, I'll call it report data .tde. I could also write to some, I could write to multiple outputs at once. So maybe here I want to write to an XLSX file as well. And I'll give it a sheet name. So when I run this process, we note in the um, oh, uh, set these to overwrite. Uh, we notice in our log here on the bottom left, it tells us that these uh, files were written. So there's a lot of flexibility in writing to files. We could also just as easily write back to our SQL Server database. 
uh, or some other type of database. We could write to Oracle or Hadoop or something else. Um, we could also, in, I suppose our process was actually bigger than this. We could extend what we've produced here and incorporate a predictive analytics, uh, any type of predictive models that come packaged with our product. Uh, we could include some spatial analytics if we wanted to uh, maybe maybe use spatial data or consume some spatial data for store locations or trade area creation or something like that. Uh, we've also got a variety of um, enrichment data sets that we have access to that can pull demographic data and enrich the data that we already have for our customers. All right, uh, so that is it for the demo. Um, Beth, do you have some final thoughts around these concepts? Yeah, I think to, um, before we move into Q&A, um, just kind of to summarize, you know, I think at the end of the day, Dan, definitely showed you the Alteryx workflow, but we also saw a little bit of SQL in terms of how the SQL code would be written. So I think kind of just to summarize our points as well as the demo, oftentimes analysts are tasked with writing hundreds, even thousands of lines of code um, to help them build out a data or an analytics process. And whether or not you're a savvy SQL coder or not, um, it's definitely something that can be time consuming to test and debug, which we talked through earlier, um, but also when you're kind of thinking in terms of your broader organization, translating that process so people understand the steps that you take sometimes can be challenging if someone is not familiar with SQL code. So instead of knowing the ins and outs of some of the statements that Dan went through, um, I think we, we talked about select, we talked about group by, we talked about join and distinct. Um, with Alteryx, rather than focusing on the code, really what we're asking you to focus on is to to know your data and to improve your analysis. Um, so if, if you look at the, the next slide, which has a visual screenshot of our workflow, our goal is really to empower you as the analyst with the ability to generate this full analytics process in a drag and drop workflow environment. Um, so where whether or not you can create simple SQL queries, if you're looking to create a more complex process um, that you would have handed off to a SQL developer or someone in the IT team, you actually, with Alteryx, have the ability to create those processes yourself. Um, so as an analyst, it's giving you the ability to be more efficient with your time. Um, it also is helping generally the IT team to alleviate some of the backlogs for those complicated SQL queries since you as the analyst have the ability to do it yourself. And at the end of the day, again, the kind of real value that we talked about is delivering deeper insights in hours, not weeks. Um, so I think Dan did a great job at the demo at kind of showing you how you would do that within Alteryx, but at the end of the day, really the ability to create this process that's transparent not only to the SQL coder, to the business analyst, but also to decision makers across the organization is really what we're trying to help deliver. And we did want to leave you with a few kind of final assets in terms of where you can go next for more information. Um, if you go to the next slide, please, Dan. We do have a brand new um, website that we're launching later this afternoon, and we're calling it the Alteryx Translator. Um, so it will be available this afternoon at alteryx.com slash alteryx dash four dash SQL. And what we're really trying to show you here um, when we launch that which really kind of aligns with the webinar that we did today, is if you know what your SQL code looks like, you've created it, we want to help you be able to translate that, if you will, into what it would look like in Alteryx. So when this goes live this afternoon, you'll see on the left-hand side what the SQL code looks like, and then on the right-hand side, the actual tools that you would use within Alteryx um, to do the same type of process. And the other point that we wanted to leave you at is to check out our product training website um, because we do actually have a pre-recorded session that talks specifically to the most common SQL processes that analysts run. Um, and it's about a 62, I think it's an hour long session um, that will kind of walk you through more with a trial download what the process will look like when you're building it out in Alteryx. So you can pause it if you need to pause it at certain points and really help you understand how that workflow will be built. So they're great resources if you want to check those out. Um, and I think I'll turn it over, Shannon, to you, because I do know that we had some questions that were coming in. 
Yes, lots of great questions coming in. And just to answer the most commonly asked question, just a reminder, I will be sending a link to the slides and to the recording of this session uh, within two business days, so by end of day Thursday for this webinar to all registrants. Uh, and just to dive right into it here, um, Dan and Beth, thanks so much for this, this great. Uh, it's definitely inspired a, a lot of good discussion here. Uh, a very direct question, um, can Altrex connect to Workday? Uh, I don't think so. So that's an API. Is that a is that an API based uh, thing? Uh, you know, I can ask the uh, attendee to expand a bit. Certainly. So if I, I believe that it is that there is an API for it, one of the um, pieces that we have built into the product is a tool called the download tool that allows you to make HTTP requests. So uh, that tool is here. Uh, let me just search for it. Download tool. Um, this allows you to pass uh, pass some type of um, request to an API and receive the response in the middle of your stream. Um, so we have a series of connectors here that we've packaged with the product. So things like um, we have an Amazon connector, Marketo, um, Google Analytics, Salesforce, um, and SharePoint, and things like that that are kind of standard. Uh, for, for APIs that are outside of this um, package list, you can uh, also you, you can just code your own uh, connectors with our download tool. We also have other clients that have um, that have uh, built connectors to other services beyond this list that are available for free download from our um, our public gallery. Uh, so you can add supplemental content into your Alteryx designer from our public gallery based off of development that other customers have done to address like, you know, specific connectors and specific data types of problems that we haven't um, packaged within the product. All righty. And, you know, I'd be surprised if this question didn't come up. It's one of the, the hottest topics in our community. Um, how does Altrix manage metadata? Can it generate metadata for targets and store these in a metadata management system? Uh, yes. So we we have some tools that are built into the process related to metadata. So one of those is called uh, Field Info. Field Info can take um, take metadata and turn it into data. So let's see how this works. I'm pointing it at my orders database. It looks at the incoming data. It tells me the field name, the uh, incoming type and size, uh, and then also uh, some information about the source location. Um, so you can do all kinds of things with this and with this data. Um, oftentimes, you'll find that there are multiple ways to accomplish a certain thing with Alteryx. The product is very extens extensible in that we we provide the real fundamental building blocks of data work, and you can kind of craft whatever solution uh, you need to. Um, given those fundamental building blocks. So we have a lot of customers that will use a, a tool like Field Info to generate like a um, some type of validation report or to interface with some other type of metadata management tool as part of the output. So you may have some outputs that are metadata re related and you may have some outputs that are actually data related. Love it. Uh, so, what um, protections are available for personally identifiable information? Uh, for example, can data be masked, uh, whether reversibly or not? Uh, we don't really have anything that's built into the product to deal with obfuscating or masking of data. Um, this is a desktop product. Alteryx Designer is a desktop product. Um, we, we do have a variety of functions that you can access through the formula tool. So we have this library of functions available here. Um, 
functions related to string operations, including uh, hashing um, and other types of uh, string operations around stripping or regex, um, things like that. So you could you could easily build uh, some type of process with a f uh, series of formulas to maybe uh, hash certain types of data and then ex output that hashed file. Um, let's just say we had a, a column called social security number and you can you could hash those values, output it to uh, back to SQL or to a TDE or something else so that downstream users wouldn't ever uh, see the actual values. All righty, and does Altrix have uh, in database capabilities? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, it's kind of a hot topic these days as uh, more database vendors are providing um, more capabilities around in database processing, including um, data modeling and predictive modeling. Uh, we do have a category called in database, and these tools are intended to be used um, kind of as a group. And what they do is they they each um, add to a SQL query that gets executed at the end of the in-database process. So I'm, let me just mock up a, an example here. Uh, I would connect in DB where I point to uh, a particular location. And then I uh, can do some kind of basic operations. We have a subset of functionality that comes that, that's similar to like functions that are available for non in, in database operations. Uh, I have an, the ability to write in database. So I have a tool called write data in DB. So um, if I wanted to create other tables on the fly, I could do that. Uh, I could create temp tables that way. This series of tools that I've created um, is just resulting in one master SQL query will, that will get executed at runtime. And at this point in time, I'm actually not requesting any records come back to me, to, to this application machine. All that's going to happen is one query is going to get shuttled off to the SQL server for execution. If I do want uh, some record set, probably a filtered record set to come back to me, I can use a tool called data stream out that will request records come back to this Alteryx machine. Uh, so this is used mostly for cases where you're working with a really large amount of data and you want to take advantage of horsepower on your SQL a server, you don't want to have to stream millions and millions of records across the network and then put them back into the database. So uh, this is a real, this is kind of a newer feature set, and we're expanding this a lot to take advantage of uh, some of the technology that's um, coming down the road in in Microsoft and Oracle and some other um, relational databases around um, predictive modeling as well. I love all the specific questions coming in here. Um, is there a performance penalty for leaving the browse tools in the workflow? Yes, there is some performance penalty. The the full data at that point in the process is written to temp file. Uh, so um, you will see some performance hit. Um, generally, you, you probably wouldn't want to have like browse tools all over the place if you have a large volume of data. Um, there are a variety of different options for uh, speeding the development cycle. Um, one possibility is that in the input tool, you can limit the number of records that come in and then uh, remove that limitation at production time. Uh, we have some ability in the runtime settings to um, disable all browse tools. So when you're production ready, you can come in and turn click this so that they're all still present, but none of them are going to execute. And I got so excited by the presentation and all the questions coming in, I just realized we are 
out of time, um, but we are right at the top of the hour. I will get these. We've got so many great questions. I will get these over to you. And likewise, um, just a reminder to all the attendees, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Thursday with links to the slides and the recording. And um, that will also include, include a, a contact information for you um, to contact Altrex for additional questions and such. Dan and Beth, thank you so much for uh, taking the time to be with us today. It's just been a great presentation. Clearly, um, uh, the attendees are, are asking a lot of questions here, um, and which means great involvement. And thanks to our attendees for being so engaged in everything we do. We do just love all the questions that come in and, and, uh, and the engagement with the webinars themselves. So with that, I hope everyone has a great day, and um, I hope you can all attend the uh, uh, March 28th webinar coming up as well with Altrix. Beth and Dan, thank you so much. Sure. Thanks. Thanks, everyone, for your time.